Hello friends, I want to welcome you to the second installment in this reading of The Secret Garden. Tonight I will be reading for you chapters 4, 5 and 6. Let us unwind in a comfortable and safe place, your couch, your bed or perhaps your favorite chair. And let us begin these chapters. Chapter 4 Martha When she opened her eyes in the morning, it was because a young housemaid had come into her room to light the fire and was kneeling on the hearth rug, raking out the cinders noisily. Mary lay and watched her for a few moments, and then began to look about the room. She had never seen a room at all like it, and thought it curious and gloomy. The walls were covered with tapestry, with a forest scene embroidered on it. There were fantastically dressed people under the trees, and in the distance there was a glimpse of the turrets of a castle. There were hunters and horses and dogs and ladies. Mary felt as if she were in the forest with them. Out of a deep window she could see a great climbing stretch of land, which seemed to have no trees on it and to look rather like an endless, dull, purplish sea. What is that? she said, pointing out of the window. Martha, the young housemaid, who had just risen to her feet, looked and pointed also. That there, she said. Yes, that's the moor, with a good-natured grin. Does the like it? No, answered Mary, I hate it. That's because thou'rt not used to it, Martha said, going back to her hearth. Thou thinks it's too big and bare now, but thou will like it. Do you? inquired Mary. Aye, I do, answered Martha, cheerfully, polishing away at the grate. I just love it. It's none bare. It's covered with growing things, as smells sweet. It's fair lovely in spring and summer, and when the gorse and broom and heather's in flower. It smells of honey, and there's such a lot of fresh air. And the sky looks so high, and the bees and skylarks make such a nice noise humming and singing, eh? I wouldn't live away from the moor for anything. Mary listened to her with a grave, puzzled expression. The native servants she had been used to in India were not in the least like this. They were obsequious and servile, and did not presume to talk to the masters as if they were their equals. They made salams, and called them protector of the poor, and names of that sort. Indian servants were commanded to do things, not asked. It was not the custom to say please and thank you, and Mary had always slapped her Aya in the face when she was angry. She wondered a little what this girl would do if one slapped her in the face. She was a round, rosy, good-natured-looking creature, but she had a sturdy way which made Mistress Mary wonder if she might not even slap back, if the person who slapped her was only a little girl. You are a strange servant, she said from her pillows rather haughtily. Martha sat up on her heels, with her blacking brush in her hand, and laughed without seeming the least out of temper. Eh, hey, I know that, she said. 
if there was a grand missus at Misselthwaite, I should never have been even one of the under housemates. I might have been let to be scullery maid, but I'd never have been let upstairs. I'm too common, and I talk too much Yorkshire. But this is a funny house for all it's so grand. Seems like there's neither master nor mistress except Mr. Pitcher and Mrs. Medlock. Mr. Craven, he won't be troubled about anything when he's here, and he's nearly always away. And Mrs. Medlock gave me the place out of kindness. She told me she could never have done it if Misselthwaite had been like other big houses. Are you going to be my servant? Mary asked, still in her imperious little Indian way. Martha began to rub her grate again. I am Mrs. Medlock's servant, she said stoutly, and she's Mr. Craven's, but I am to do the housemaid's work up here and wait on you a bit. But you won't need much waiting on. Who is going to dress me? demanded Mary. Martha sat up on her heels again and stared. She spoke and brought Yorkshire in her amazement. Can I thou dress thy son? she said. What do you mean? I don't understand your language, said Mary. Eh, I forgot, Martha said. Mrs. Medlock told me I have to be careful or you wouldn't know what I was saying. I mean, can't you put on your own clothes? No, answered Mary quite indignantly. I never did in my life. My ayah dressed me, of course. Well, said Martha, evidently not in the least aware that she was impudent. It's time thou should learn. Thou cannot begin younger. It'll do thee good to wait on thy son a bit. My mother always said she couldn't see why grand people's children didn't turn out fair fools. What with nurses, and being washed, and dressed, and took out to walk as if they was puppies. It is different in India, said Mistress Mary disdainfully. She could scarcely stand this. But Martha was not at all crushed. Eh, I can see it's different, she answered almost sympathetically. I dare say it's because there's such a lot of blacks there instead of respectable white people. When I heard you was coming from India, I thought you was a black too. Mary sat up in bed, furious. What? she said. What? You thought I was a native? You, you daughter of a pig. Martha stared and looked hot. Who are you calling names? she said. You needn't be so vexed. That's not the way for a young lady to talk. I have nothing against the blacks. When you read about them in tracts, they are always very religious. You always read as a blacks, a man and a brother. I've never seen a black, and I was fair pleased to think I was going to see one close. When I come in to light your fire this morning, I crept up to your bed and pulled the cover back careful to look at you. And there was you, disappointedly, no more black than me. For all you're so yellow. Mary did not even try to control her rage and humiliation. You thought I was a native. You dared. You don't know anything about natives. They are not people. They are servants who must salam to you. You know nothing about India. You know nothing about anything. She was in such a rage and felt so helpless before the girl's simple stare. And somehow she suddenly felt so horribly lonely and far away from everything she understood and which understood her, that she threw herself face downward on the pillows and burst into passionate sobbing.
She sobbed so unrestrainedly that good-natured Yorkshire Martha was a little frightened and quite sorry for her. She went to the bed and bent over her. Eh, you mustn't cry like that there, she begged. You mustn't for sure. I didn't know you'd be vexed. I don't know anything about anything. Just like you said. I beg your pardon, miss. Do stop crying. There was something comforting and really friendly in her queer Yorkshire speech and sturdy way which had a good effect on Mary. She gradually ceased crying and became quiet. Martha looked relieved. It's time for thee to get up now. Mrs. Medlock said I was to carry the breakfast and tea and dinner into the room next to this. It's been made into a nursery for thee. I'll help thee on with thy clothes if thou get out of bed. If the buttons are at the back, and thou can button them up thyself. When Mary at last decided to get up. The clothes Martha took from the wardrobe were not the ones she had worn when she arrived the night before with Mrs. Medlock. Those are not mine, she said. Mine are black. She looked the thick white wool coat and dress over and added with cool approval. Those are nicer than mine. These are the ones thou must put on, Martha answered. Mr. Craven ordered Mrs. Medlock to get him in London. He said I won't have a child dressed in black wandering about like a lost soul, he said. It make the place sadder than it is. Put color on her. Mother, she said, she knew what he meant. Mother always knows what a body means. She doesn't hold with black herself. I hate black things, said Mary. The dressing process was one which taught them both something. Martha had buttoned up her little sister and brothers, but she had never seen a child who stood still and waited for another person to do things for her as if she had neither hands nor feet of her own. Why doesn't that put on their own shoes? she said when Martha quietly held out her foot. My ayah did it, answered Mary, staring. It was the custom. She said that very often. It was the custom. The native servants were always saying it. If one told them to do a thing their ancestors had not done for a thousand years, they gazed at one mildly and said, It is not the custom and one knew that was the end of the matter. It had not been the custom that Mistress Mary should do anything but stand and allow herself to be dressed like a doll. But before she was ready for breakfast, she began to suspect that her life at Misselthwaite Manor would end by teaching her a number of things quite new to her. Things such as putting on her own shoes and stockings, and picking up things she let fall. If Martha had been a well-trained, fine young lady's mate, she would have been more subservient and respectful, and would have known that it was her business to brush hair, and button boots, and pick things up and lay them away. She was, however, only an untrained Yorkshire rustic who had been brought up in a moorland cottage with a swarm of little brothers and sisters, who had never dreamed of doing anything but waiting on themselves, and on the younger ones, who were either babies in arms, or just learning to totter about and tumble over things. If Mary Lennox had been a child who was ready to be amused, she would perhaps have laughed at Martha's readiness to talk but Mary only listened to her coldly and wondered at her freedom of manner. At first she was not at all interested, but gradually, as the girl rattled on in a good-tempered homely way, 
Mary began to notice what she was saying. Eh, hey, you should see em all, she said. There's twelve of us, and my father only gets sixteen shilling a week. I can tell you my mother's put to it to get porridge for them all. They tumble about on the moor and play there all day, and mother says the air of the moor fattens them. She says she believes they eat the grass same as the wild ponies do. Our Dickon, he's twelve years old, and he's got a young pony he calls his own. Where did he get it? asked Mary. He found it on the moor with its mother when it was a little one, and he began to make friends with it and give it bits of bread and pluck young grass for it. And it got to like him, so it follows him about, and it lets him get on its back. Dickens a kind lad, and animals like him. Mary had never possessed an animal pet of her own, and had always thought she should like one. So she began to feel a slight interest in Dickon, and as she had never before been interested in anyone but herself, it was the dawning of a healthy sentiment. When she went into the room which had been made into a nursery for her, she found that it was rather like the one she had slept in. It was not a child's room, but a grown-up person's room, with gloomy old pictures on the walls and heavy old oak chairs. A table in the center was set with a good substantial breakfast but she had always had a very small appetite, and she looked with something more than indifference at the first plate Martha set before her. I don't want it, she said. Thou doesn't want thy porridge, Martha exclaimed incredulously. No. Thou doesn't know how good it is. Put a bit of treacle on it or a bit of sugar. I don't want it, repeated Mary. Eh, said Martha, I can't abide to see good victuals go to waste. If our children was at this table, they'd clean it bare in five minutes. Why? said Mary coldly. Why? echoed Martha. Because they scarce ever had their stomachs full in their lives. They are as hungry as young hogs and foxes. I don't know what it is to be hungry, said Mary, with the indifference of ignorance. Martha looked indignant. Well, it would do thee good to try it. I can see that plain enough, she said outspokenly. I've no patience with folks as sits and just stares at good bread and meat. My word. Don't I wish Dickon and Phil and Jane and the rest of them had what's here under their pinafores? Why don't you take it to them? suggested Mary. It's not mine, answered Martha stoutly. And this isn't my day out. I get my day out once a month, same as the rest. Then I go home and clean up for Mother and give her a day's rest. Mary drank some tea and ate a little toast and some marmalade. You wrap up warm and run out and play, you, said Martha. It'll do you good and give you some stomach for your meat. Mary went to the window. There were gardens and paths and big trees, but everything looked dull and wintry. Out? Why should I go out on a day like this? Well, if thou doesn't go out, thou'lt have to stay in, and what hast thou got to do? Mary glanced about her. There was nothing to do. When Mrs. Medlock had prepared the nursery, she had not thought of amusement. Perhaps it would be better to go and see what the gardens were like. Who will go with me? she inquired. Martha stared. You'll go by yourself, she answered. You'll have to learn to play like other children does. 
when they haven't got sisters or brothers. Our Dickon goes off on the moor by himself and plays for hours. That's how he made friends with the pony. He's got sheep on the moor that knows him, and birds as come and eats out of his hand. However little there is to eat, he always saves a bit of his bread to coax his pets. It was really this mention of Dickon which made Mary decide to go out, though she was not aware of it. There would be birds outside, though there would not be ponies or sheep. They would be different from the birds in India, and it might amuse her to look at them. Martha found her coat and hat for her, and a pair of stout little boots, and she showed her her way downstairs. If thou goes round that way, thou'll come to the gardens, pointing to a gate in a wall of shrubbery. There's lots of flowers in summertime, but there's nothing blooming now. She seemed to hesitate a second before she added, One of the gardens is locked up. No one has been in it for ten years. Why? asked Mary in spite of herself. Here was another locked door, added to the hundred in the strange house. Mr. Craven had it shut when his wife died so sudden. He won't let no one go inside. It was her garden. He locked the door and dug a hole and buried the key. There's Mrs. Medlock's bell ringing. I must run. After she was gone, Mary turned down the walk, which led to the door in the shrubbery. She could not help thinking about the garden, which no one had been into for ten years. She wondered what it would look like, and whether there were any flowers still alive in it. When she had passed through the shrubbery gate, she found herself in great gardens, with wide lawns and winding walks, with clipped borders. There were trees and flower beds and evergreens clipped into strange shapes, and a large pool with an old grey fountain in its midst. But the flower beds were bare and wintry, and the fountain was not playing. And this was not the garden which was shut up. How could a garden be shut up? You could always walk into a garden. She was just thinking this when she saw that, at the end of the path she was following, there seemed to be a long wall with ivy growing over it. She was not familiar enough with England to know that she was coming upon the kitchen gardens where the vegetables and fruit were growing. She went toward the wall and found that there was a green door in the ivy, and that it stood open. This was not the closed garden, evidently, and she could go into it. She went through the door and found that it was a garden with walls all around it, and that it was only one of several walled gardens which seemed to open into one another. She saw another open green door, revealing bushes and pathways between beds, containing winter vegetables. Fruit trees were trained flat against the wall, and over some of the beds there were glass frames. The place was bare and ugly enough, Mary thought, as she stood and stared about her. It might be nicer in summer when things were green, but there was nothing pretty about it now. Presently an old man with a spade over his shoulder walked through the door leading from the second garden. He looked startled when he saw Mary and then touched his cap. He had a surly old face and did not seem at all pleased to see her, but then she was displeased with his garden and wore her quite contrary expression and certainly did not seem at all pleased to see him. What is this place? she asked. One of the kitchen gardens, he answered. 
What is that? said Mary, pointing through the other green door. Another of them, shortly. There's another on the other side of the wall, and there's the orchard the other side of that. Can I go in them? asked Mary. If the likes. But there's no to see. Mary made no response. She went down to the path and through the second green door. There she found more walls and winter vegetables and glass frames. But in the second wall there was another green door, and it was not open. Perhaps it led into the garden which no one had seen for ten years, as she was not at all a timid child, and always did what she wanted to do. Mary went to the green door and turned the handle. She hoped the door would not open, because she wanted to be sure she had found the mysterious garden. But it did open, quite easily, and she walked through it and found herself in an orchard. There were walls all around it, also, and trees trained against them. And there were bare fruit trees growing in winter-browned grass but there was no green door to be seen anywhere. Mary looked for it, and yet when she had entered the upper end of the garden, she had noticed that the wall did not seem to end with the orchard, but to extend beyond it, as if it enclosed the place at the other side. She could see the tops of trees above the wall, and when she stood still, she saw a bird with a bright red breast, sitting on the topmost branch of one of them, and suddenly he burst into his winter song, almost as if he had caught sight of her and was calling to her. She stopped and listened to him, and somehow his cheerful, friendly little whistle gave her a pleased feeling. Even a disagreeable little girl may be lonely, and the big closed house and the big bare moor and the big bear gardens had made this one feel as if there was no one left in the world but herself. If she had been an affectionate child, who had been used to being loved, she would have broken her heart. But, even though she was Mistress Mary quite contrary, she was desolate, and the bright-breasted little bird brought a look into her sour little face, which was almost a smile. She listened to him until he flew away. He was not like an Indian bird, and she liked him and wondered if she should ever see him again. Perhaps he lived in the mysterious garden and knew all about it. Perhaps it was because she had nothing whatever to do that she thought so much of the deserted garden. She was curious about it and wanted to see what it was like. Why had Mr. Archibald Craven buried the key? If he had liked his wife so much, why did he hate her garden? She wondered if she should ever see him. But she knew that if she did, she should not like him. And he would not like her and that she should only stand and stare at him and say nothing, though she should be wanting dreadfully to ask him why he had done such a queer thing. People never like me, and I never like people, she thought, and I never can talk as the Crawford children could. They were always talking and laughing and making noises. She thought of the robin, and of the way he seemed to sing his song at her. And as she remembered the treetop he perched on, she stopped rather suddenly on the path. I believe that tree was in the secret garden. I feel sure it was, she said. There was a wall around the place, and there was no door. She walked back into the first kitchen garden. She had entered and found the old man digging there. 
she went and stood beside him and watched him a few moments in her cold little way. He took no notice of her, and so, at last, she spoke to him. I have been into the other gardens, she said. There was nothing to prevent thee, he answered crustily. I went into the orchard. There was no dog at the door to bite thee, he answered. There was no door there into the other garden, said Mary. What garden? he said in a rough voice, stopping his digging for a moment. The one on the other side of the wall, answered Mistress Mary. There are trees there, I saw the tops of them. A bird with a red breast was sitting on one of them, and he sang. To her surprise, the surly old weather-beaten face actually changed its expression. A slow smile spread over it, and the gardener looked quite different. It made her think that it was curious how much nicer a person looked when he smiled. She had not thought of it before. He turned about to the orchard side of his garden and began to whistle. A low, soft whistle. She could not understand how such a surly man could make such a coaxing sound. Almost the next moment, a wonderful thing happened. She heard a soft little rushing flight through the air, and it was the bird with the red breast flying to them. And he actually alighted on the big clod of earth quite near to the gardener's foot. Here he is, chuckled the old man, and then he spoke to the bird as if he were speaking to a child. Where hast thou been, thou cheeky little beggar? he said. I have not seen thee before today. Hast thou begun thy courting this early in the season? Thou art too far it. The bird put his tiny head on one side and looked up at him with his soft, bright eye, which was like a black dewdrop. He seemed quite familiar and not the least afraid. He hopped about and pecked the earth briskly, looking for seeds and insects. It actually gave Mary a queer feeling in the heart, because he was so pretty and cheerful, and seemed so like a person. He had a tiny plump body and a delicate beak, and slender, delicate legs. Aye, that he will. I have known him ever since he was fledgling. He came out of the nest in the other garden, and when first he flew over the wall, he was too weak to fly back for a few days, and we got friendly. When he went over the wall again, the rest of the brood was gone, and he was lonely, and he come back to me. What kind of bird is he? Mary asked. Doesn't I know? He's a robin redbreast, and they're the friendliest, curiousest birds alive. They're almost as friendly as dogs, if you know how to get on with them. Watch him pecking about there and looking round at us now and again. He knows we are talking about him. It was the queerest thing in the world to see the old fellow. He looked at the plump little scarlet wainscot bird as if he were both proud and fond of him. He's a conceited one, he chuckled. He likes to hear folk talk about him, and curious, bless me, there never was his like for curiosity and meddling. He's always coming to see what I'm planting. He knows all the things Mr. Craven never troubles his soul to find out. He's the head gardener, he is. The robin hopped about busily, pecking the soil, and now and then stopped and looked at them a little. Mary thought his black dewdrop eyes gazed at her with great curiosity. It really seemed as if he were finding out all about her. The queer feeling in her heart increased. Where did the rest of the brood fly to? she asked. There's no knowing, 
the old ones turn him out of the nest and make him fly, and they are scattered before you know it. This one was a knowing one, and he knew he was lonely. Mistress Mary went a step nearer to the robin and looked at him very hard. I am lonely, she said. She had not known before that this was one of the things which made her feel sour and cross. She seemed to find it out when the robin looked at her, and she looked at the robin. The old gardener pushed his cap back on his bald head, and stared at her a minute. Art thou the little wench from India? he asked. Mary nodded. Then no wonder thou art lonely. Thou'lt be lonelier before thou's done, he said. He began to dig again, driving his spade deep into the rich black garden soil, while the robin hopped about very busily employed. What is your name? Mary inquired. He stood up to answer her. Ben Weatherstaff, he answered, and then he added with a surly chuckle, I'm lonely myself, except when he's with me, and he jerked his thumb toward the robin. He's the only friend I've got. I have no friends at all, said Mary. I never had. My ayah didn't like me, and I never played with anyone. It is a Yorkshire habit to say what you think with blunt frankness, and old Ben Weatherstaff was a Yorkshire moor man. Da and me are a good bit alike, he said. We was wolled out of the same cloth. We are neither of us good-looking, and we are both of us as sour as we look. We've got the same nasty tempers, both of us, I'll warrant. This was plain speaking, and Mary Lennox had never heard the truth about herself in her life. Native servants always salaamed and submitted to you, whatever you did. She had never thought much about her looks, but she wondered if she was as unattractive as Ben Weatherstaff, and she also wondered if she looked as sour as he had looked before the robin came. She actually began to wonder also if she was nasty-tempered. She felt uncomfortable. Suddenly a clear rippling little sound broke out near her, and she turned round. She was standing a few feet from a young apple tree, and the robin had flown onto one of its branches, and had burst out into a scrap of a song. Ben Weatherstaff laughed outright. What did he do that for? asked Mary. He's made up his mind to make friends with thee, replied Ben. Dang me if he hasn't took a fancy to thee. To me? said Mary. And she moved toward the little tree softly and looked up. Would you make friends with me? she said to the robin, just as if she was speaking to a person. Would you? and she did not say it either in her hard little voice or in her imperious Indian voice, but in a tone so soft and eager and coaxing that Ben Weatherstaff was as surprised as she had been when she heard him whistle. Why, he cried out, thou said that as nice a human as if there was a real child instead of a sharp old woman. Da said it almost like Dickon talks to his wild things on the moor. Do you know Dickon? Mary asked, turning round rather in a hurry. Everybody knows him. Dickon's wandering about everywhere. The very blackberries and heatherbells knows him. I warrant the foxes show him where their cubs lies, and the skylarks doesn't hide their nests from him. Mary would have liked to ask some more questions. She was almost as curious about Dickon as she was about the deserted garden. But just that moment, the robin, who had ended his song, gave a little shake of his wings and spread them and flew away. He had made his visit and had other things to do. 
He has flown over the wall, Mary cried out, watching him. He has flown into the orchard. He has flown across the other wall, into the garden where there is no door. He lives there, said old Ben. He came out of the egg there. He is courting. He is making up to some young madam of a robin that lives among the old rose trees there. Rose trees, said Mary. Are there rose trees? Ben Weatherstaff took up his spade again and began to dig. There was ten years ago, he mumbled. I should like to see them, said Mary. Where is the green door? There must be a door somewhere. Ben drove his spade deep and looked as uncompanionable as he had looked when she first saw him. There was ten years ago, but there isn't now, he said. No door, cried Mary. There must be. None as anyone can find, and none as is anyone's business. Don't you be a meddlesome wrench and poke your nose where it's no cause to go. Here, I must go on with my work. Get you gone and play you. I've no more time. And he actually stopped digging, threw his spade over his shoulder, and walked off, without even glancing at her, or saying goodbye. Chapter 5 The Cry in the Corridor At first, each day which passed by for Mary Lennox was exactly like the others. Every morning she awoke in her tapestried room and found Martha kneeling upon the hearth, building her fire. Every morning she ate her breakfast in the nursery, which had nothing amusing in it. And after each breakfast she gazed out of the window across the huge moor, which seemed to spread out on all sides and climb up to the sky. And after she had stared out for a while, she realized that if she did not go out, she would have to stay in and do nothing. And so she went out. She did not know that this was the best thing she could have done. And she did not know that, when she began to walk quickly or even run along the paths and down the avenue, she was stirring her slow blood and making herself stronger by fighting with the wind which swept down from the moor. She ran only to make herself warm, and she hated the wind which rushed at her face and roared and held her back as if it were some giant she could not see. But the big breaths of rough fresh air blown over the heather filled her lungs with something which was good for her whole thin body, and whipped some red color into her cheeks and brightened her dull eyes when she did not know anything about it. But after a few days spent almost entirely out of doors, she wakened one morning, knowing what it was to be hungry. And when she sat down to her breakfast, she did not glance disdainfully at her porridge and push it away, but took up her spoon and began to eat it, and went on eating it until her bowl was empty. Thou got on well enough with that this morning, didn't thou? said Martha. It tastes nice today, said Mary, feeling a little surprised herself. It's the air of the moor that's given thee stomach for the victuals, answered Martha. It's lucky for thee that that's got victuals as well as appetite. There's been twelve in our cottage, and had the stomach and nothing to put in it. You go and play in you, out of doors, every day, and you'll get some flesh on your bones, and you won't be so yellow. I don't play, said Mary. I have nothing to play with. 
Nothing to play with, exclaimed Martha. Our children plays with sticks and stones. They just runs about and shouts and looks at things. Mary did not shout, but she looked at things. There was nothing else to do. She walked round and round the gardens and wandered about the paths in the park. Sometimes she looked for Ben Weatherstaff. But though several times she saw him at work, he was too busy to look at her or was too surly. Once, when she was walking toward him, he picked up his spade and turned away as if he did it on purpose. One place she went to oftener than any other. It was the long walk outside the gardens, with the walls around them. There were bare flower beds on either side of it, and against the walls ivy grew thickly. There was one part of the wall where the creeping dark green leaves were more bushy than elsewhere. It seemed as if for a long time that part had been neglected. The rest of it had been clipped and made to look neat, but at this lower end of the walk it had not been trimmed at all. A few days after she had talked to Ben Weatherstaff, Mary stopped to notice this and wondered why it was so. She had just passed and was looking up at a long spray of ivy swinging in the wind when she saw a gleam of scarlet and heard a brilliant chirp. And there, on the top of the wall, perched Ben Weatherstaff's robin redbreast, tilting forward and look at her with his small head on one side. Oh! she cried out. Is it you? Is it you? And it did not seem at all queer to her that she spoke to him as if she were sure that he would understand and answer her. He did answer. He twittered and chirped and hopped along the wall as if he were telling her all sorts of things. It seemed to Mistress Mary as if she understood him, too, so he was not speaking in words. It was as if he said, Good morning. Isn't the wind nice? Isn't the sun nice? Isn't everything nice? Let us both chirp and hop and twitter. Come on, come on. Mary began to laugh and as he hopped and took little flights along the wall, she ran after him. Poor, little, thin, sallow, ugly Mary. She actually looked almost pretty for a moment. I like you, I like you, she cried out, pattering down the walk, and she chirped and tried to whistle which last she did not know how to do in the least. But the robin seemed to be quite satisfied, and chirped and whistled back at her. At last he spread his wings and made a darting flight to the top of a tree, where he perched and sang loudly. That reminded Mary of the first time she had seen him. He had been swinging on a treetop then, and she had been standing in the orchard. Now she was on the other side of the orchard, and standing in the path outside the wall, much lower down, and there was the same tree inside. It's in the garden no one can go into, she said to herself. It's the garden without the door. He lives in there. How I wish I could see what it is like. She ran up the walk to the green door she had entered the first morning. Then she ran down to the path through the other door, and then into the orchard. And when she stood and looked up, there was the tree on the other side of the wall. And there was the robin, just finishing his song and beginning to preen his feathers with his beak. It is the garden, she said. I am sure it is. She walked round and looked closely at that side of the orchard wall. 
but she only found what she had found before, that there was no door in it. Then she ran through the kitchen gardens again, and out into the walk outside the long ivy-covered wall. And she walked to the end of it, and looked at it. But there was no door. And then she walked to the other end, looking again. But there was no door. It's very queer, she said. Ben Weatherstaff said there was no door, and there is no door. But there must have been one ten years ago, because Mr. Craven buried the key. And this gave her so much to think of that she began to be quite interested and feel that she was not sorry that she had come to Misselthwaite Manor. In India she had always felt hot and too languid to care much about anything. The fact was that the fresh wind from the moor had begun to blow the cobwebs out of her young brain and to waken her up a little. She stayed out of doors nearly all day, and when she sat down to her supper at night, she felt hungry and drowsy and comfortable. She did not feel cross when Martha chattered away. She felt as if she rather liked to hear her, and at last she thought she would ask her a question. She asked it after she had finished her supper and had sat down on the hearth rug before the fire. Why did Mr. Craven hate the garden? she said. She made Martha stay with her, and Martha had not objected at all. She was very young, and used to a crowded cottage full of brothers and sisters, and she found it dull in the great servants' hall downstairs where the footmen and the upper housemaids made fun of her Yorkshire speech, and looked upon her as a common little thing, and sat and whispered among themselves. Martha liked to talk, and the strange child who had lived in India and been waited upon by blacks was novelty enough to attract her. She sat down on the hearth herself, without waiting to be asked. Art thou thinking about that garden yet? she said. I knew there would. That was just the way with me when I first heard about it. Why did he hate it? Mary persisted. Martha tucked her feet under her and made herself quite comfortable. Listen to the wind withering around the house, she said. You could bear stand up on the moor if you was out on it tonight. Mary did not know what Wuthering meant until she listened, and then she understood. It must mean that hollow, shuddering sort of roar, which rushed round and round the house, as if the giant no one could see were buffeting it and beating at the walls and windows to try to break in. But one knew he could not get in, and somehow it made one feel very safe and warm inside a room with a red coal fire. But why did he hate it so? she asked after she had listened. She intended to know if Martha did. Then Martha gave up her store of knowledge. Mind, she said, Mrs. Medlock said it's not to be talked about. There's lots of things in this place that's not to be talked over. That's Mr. Craven's orders. His troubles are non-servant's business, he says. But for the garden, he wouldn't be like he is. It was Mrs. Craven's garden that she had made when first they were married, and she just loved it. And they used to tend the flowers themselves, and none of the gardeners was ever let to go in. Him and her used to go in and shut the door and stay there hours and hours, reading and talking. And she was just a bit of a girl, and there was an old tree 
with a branch bent like a seat on it. And she made roses grow over it, and she used to sit there. But one day, when she was sitting there, the branch broke, and she fell on the ground, and was hurt so bad that next day she died. The doctor thought he'd go out of his mind and die too. That's why he hates it. No one's ever gone in since, and he won't let anyone talk about it. Mary did not ask any more questions. She looked at the red fire and listened to the wind withering. It seemed to be withering louder than ever. At that moment, a very good thing was happening to her. Four good things had happened to her, in fact, since she came to Misselthwaite Manor. She had felt as if she had understood a robin, and that he had understood her. She had run in the wind until her blood had grown warm. She had been healthily hungry for the first time in her life. And she had found out what it was to be sorry for someone. But as she was listening to the wind, she began to listen to something else. She did not know what it was, because at first she could scarcely distinguish it from the wind itself. It was a curious sound. It seemed almost as if a child were crying somewhere. Sometimes the wind sounded rather like a child crying. But presently Mistress Mary felt quite sure this sound was inside the house, not outside it. It was far away, but it was inside. She turned round and looked at Martha. Do you hear anyone crying? she said. Martha suddenly looked confused. No, she answered. Tis the wind. Sometimes it sounds like as if someone was lost on the moor and wailing. It's got all sorts of sounds. But listen, said Mary, it's in the house, down one of those long corridors. And at that very moment a door must have been opened somewhere downstairs, for a great rushing draught blew along the passage, and the door of the room they sat in was blown open with a crash, and as they both jumped to their feet, the light was blown out, and the crying sound was swept down the far corridor, so that it was to be heard more plainly than ever. There, said Mary, I told you so. It is someone crying, and it isn't a grown-up person. Martha ran and shut the door and turned the key. But before she did it, they both heard the sound of a door in the same far passage shutting with a bang. And then everything was quiet, for even the wind ceased wuthering for a few moments. "'Twas the wind," said Martha stubbornly. And if it wasn't, it was little Betty Butterworth, the scullery maid. She's had the toothache all day. But something troubled and awkward in her manner made Mistress Mary stare very hard at her. She did not believe she was speaking the truth. Chapter 6 there was someone crying, there was. The next day, the rain poured down in torrents again, and when Mary looked out of her window, the moor was almost hidden by grey mist and cloud. There could be no one going out today. What do you do in your cottage when it rains like this? she asked Martha. Try to keep from under each other's feet, mostly. Martha answered. Eh, hey, there does seem a lot of us then. Mother's a good-tempered woman, but she gets fair moithered. The biggest ones goes out to the cowshed and plays there. Dickon, he doesn't mind the wet. He goes out just the same as if the sun was shining. 
He says he sees things on rainy days, as doesn't show when it's fair weather. He once found a little fox cub half drowned in its hole, and he brought it home in the bosom of his shirt to keep it warm. Its mother had been killed nearby, and the hole was swum out, and the rest of the litter was dead. He's got it at home now. He found a half-drowned young crow another time, and he brought it home, too, and tamed it. It's named Suit because it's so black, and it hops and flies about with him everywhere. The time had come when Mary had forgotten to resent Martha's familiar talk. She had even begun to find it interesting and to be sorry when she stopped or went away. The stories she had been told by her ayah when she lived in India had been quite unlike those Martha had to tell, about the moorland cottage which held fourteen people who lived in four little rooms and never had quite enough to eat. The children seemed to tumble about and amuse themselves like a litter of rough, good-natured collie puppies. Mary was most attracted by the mother and Dickon. When Martha told stories of what Mother said or did, they always sounded comfortable. If I had a raven or a fox cub, I could play with it, said Mary, but I have nothing. Martha looked perplexed. Can I knit? she asked. No, answered Mary. Can I sew? No. Can I read? Yes. Then why doesn't I read something, or learn a bit of spelling? Thou'st old enough to be learning thy book a good bit now. I haven't any books, said Mary. Those I had were left in India. That's a pity, said Martha. If Mrs. Matlock let thee go into the library, there's thousands of books there. Mary did not ask where the library was, because she was suddenly inspired by a new idea. She made up her mind to go and find it herself. She was not troubled about Mrs. Medlock. Mrs. Medlock seemed always to be in her comfortable housekeeper's sitting room downstairs. In this queer place, one scarcely ever saw anyone at all. In fact, there was no one to see but the servants, and when their master was away, they lived a luxurious life below stairs, where there was a huge kitchen hung about with shining brass and pewter, and a large servants' hall, where there were four or five abundant meals eaten every day, and where a great deal of lively romping went on when Mrs. Medlock was out of the way. Mary's meals were served regularly, and Martha waited on her, but no one troubled themselves about her in the least. Mrs. Medlock came and looked at her every day or two, but no one inquired what she did or told her what to do. She supposed that perhaps this was the English way of treating children. In India she had always been attended by her ayah, who had followed her about and waited on her, hand and foot. She had often been tired of her company. Now she was followed by nobody, and was learning to dress herself, because Martha looked as though she thought she was silly and stupid, when she wanted to have things handed to her and put on. Hasn't that got good sense? she said once. When Mary had stood waiting for her to put on her gloves for her. Our Susan Ann is twice as sharp as thee, and she's only four years old. Sometimes thou looks fair soft in the head. Mary had worn her contrary scowl for an hour after that, but it made her think several entirely new things. She stood at the window for about ten minutes this morning, after Martha had swept up the hearth for the last time and gone downstairs. She was thinking over the new idea which had come to her when she heard of the library. She did not care very much about the library itself, 
because she had read very few books. But to hear of it brought back to her mind the hundred rooms with closed doors. She wondered if they were all really locked, and what she would find if she could get into any of them. Were there a hundred really? Why shouldn't she go and see how many doors she could count? It would be something to do on this morning, when she could not go out. She had never been taught to ask permission to do things, and she knew nothing at all about authority. So she would not have thought it necessary to ask Mrs. Medlock if she might walk about the house, even if she had seen her. She opened the door of the room and went into the corridor, and then she began her wanderings. It was a long corridor, and it branched into other corridors, and it led her up short flights of steps, which mounted to others again. There were doors and doors, and there were pictures on the walls. Sometimes they were pictures of dark, curious landscapes, but oftenest they were portraits of men and women in queer grand costumes, made of satin and velvet. She found herself in one long gallery, whose walls were covered with these portraits. She had never thought there would be so many in any house. She walked slowly down this place, and stared at the faces which also seemed to stare at her. She felt as if they were wondering what a little girl from India was doing in their house. Some were pictures of children, little girls in thick satin frocks which reached to their feet and stood out about them, and boys with puffed sleeves and lace collars and long hair, or with big ruffs around their necks. She always stopped to look at the children and wonder what their names were, and where they had gone, and why they wore such odd clothes. There was a stiff, plain little girl rather like herself. She wore a green brocade dress, and held a green parrot on her finger. Her eyes had a sharp, curious look. Where do you live now? said Mary aloud to her. I wish you were here. Surely no other little girl ever spent such a queer morning. It seemed as if there was no one in all the huge rambling house but her own small self, wandering about upstairs and down, through narrow passages and wide ones, where it seemed to her that no one but herself had ever walked. Since so many rooms had been built, People must have lived in them, but it all seemed so empty that she could not quite believe it true. It was not until she climbed to the second floor that she had thought of turning the handle of a door. All the doors were shut, as Mrs. Medlock had said they were, but at last she put her hand on a handle of one of them and turned it. She was almost frightened for a moment when she felt that it turned without difficulty, and that when she pushed upon the door itself, it slowly and heavily opened. It was a massive door, and opened into a big bedroom. There were embroidered hangings on the wall, and inlaid furniture such as she had seen in India stood about the room. A broad window with leaded panes looked out upon the moor, and over the mantel was another portrait of the stiff, plain little girl who seemed to stare at her more curiously than ever. Perhaps she slept here once, said Mary. She stares at me so that she makes me feel queer. After that she opened more doors and more, she saw so many rooms that she became quite tired, and began to think that there must be a hundred, though she had not counted them. 
In all of them, there were old pictures or old tapestries with strange scenes worked on them. There were curious pieces of furniture and curious ornaments in nearly all of them. In one room, which looked like a lady's sitting room, the hangings were all embroidered velvet. And in a cabinet were about a hundred little elephants made of ivory. They were all different sizes, and some had their mahouts or palakins on their backs. Some were much bigger than the others, and some were so tiny that they seemed only babies. Mary had seen carved ivory in India, and she knew all about elephants. She opened the door of the cabinet and stood on a footstool and played with these for quite a long time. When she got tired, she set the elephants in order and shut the door of the cabinet. In all her wanderings through the long corridors and the empty rooms, she had seen nothing alive. But in this room she saw something. Just after she had closed the cabinet door, she heard a tiny rustling sound. It made her jump and look around at the sofa by the fireplace, from which it seemed to come. In the corner of the sofa there was a cushion, and in the velvet which covered it there was a hole, and out of the hole peeped a tiny head with a pair of frightened eyes in it. Mary crept softly across the room to look. The bright eyes belonged to a little grey mouse, and the mouse had eaten a hole into the cushion, and made a comfortable nest there. Six baby mice were cuddled up asleep near her. If there was no one else alive in the hundred rooms, there were seven mice who did not look lonely at all. If they wouldn't be so frightened, I would take them back with me, said Mary. She had wandered about long enough to feel too tired to wander any farther, and she turned back. Two or three times she lost her way by turning down the wrong corridor, and was obliged to ramble up and down until she found the right one. But at last she reached her own floor again, though she was some distance from her own room and did not know exactly where she was. I believe I have taken a wrong turning again, she said, standing still at what seemed the end of a short passage, with tapestry on the wall. I don't know which way to go. How still everything is. It was while she was standing here, and just after she had said this, that the stillness was broken by a sound. It was another cry, but not quiet like the one she had heard last night. It was only a short one, a fretful childish whine, muffled by passing through walls. It's nearer than it was, said Mary, her heart beating rather faster. And it is crying. She put a hand accidentally upon the tapestry near her, and then sprang back, feeling quite startled. The tapestry was the covering of a door, which fell open and showed her that there was another part of the corridor behind it and Mrs. Medlock was coming up it with a bunch of keys in her hand and a very cross look on her face. What are you doing here? she said, and she took Mary by the arm and pulled her away. What did I tell you? I turned round the wrong corner, explained Mary. I didn't know which way to go, and I heard someone crying. She quite hated Miss Medlock at the moment, but she hated her more the next. You didn't hear anything of the sort, said the housekeeper. You come along back to your own nursery, or I'll box your ears. And she took her by the arm, and half pushed, half pulled her, up one passage and down another. 
until she pushed her in at the door of her own room. And now, she said, you stay where you're told to stay, or you'll find yourself locked up. The master had better get you a governess, same as he said he would. You're one that needs someone to look sharp after you. I've got enough to do. She went out of the room and slammed the door after her, and Mary went and sat on the hearth rug, pale with rage. She did not cry, but ground her teeth. There was someone crying. There was. There was. She said to herself. She had heard it twice now, and sometime she would find out. She had found out a great deal this morning. She felt as if she had been on a long journey. And at any rate, she had had something to amuse her all the time. And she had played with the ivory elephants, and had seen the grey mouse and its babies in their nest in the velvet cushion.